look at this fantastic title that uh, welcomes uh, Dr. Carl Vaillant. Uh, we met Carl yesterday. I'm going to continue to say Carl rather than Dr. Carl Vaillant. So Carl currently serves as the Director of Agronomy and Nutrient. And in this position, he continues proven agronomy leadership in growing the nutrient commodity and premium fertilizer product lines and promotes advanced sustainability initiative. Uh, thank you for that. And so before working in Nutrien, uh, uh, Carl served as the vice president of the Ag Science for LEA Agriculture and as an agronomist for the Elena Agri Enterprise in California and Arizona. Carl Earn is uh, advanced degree at ASU and Colorado, Colorado State University. And with that, I welcome Carl, and we're all excited to hear about the innovating phosphate fertilizer. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, I got my PhD here at ASU, tons of fun. Jim was on my committee. He really gave me the business every committee meeting, so I think, I, I think I'm tougher for it. Uh, but today I wanted to talk about innovating phosphorus fertilizer. Nutrien has a, a pathway that we took, and there's certainly others. Um, Mosaic was up here. Um, Ostara was up here yesterday. It's, it's, uh, I want to shed some light on just how hard it is to innovate in the fertilizer space, just so when you go back and you have these big ideas, or you, maybe you meet with startups in the, in the research triangle area, you can see, like, what are they going through, and, and how does it all work? So I, what I want to show you is um, this idea that we've been kind of barreling towards for the last, I'd say, 40 years at a good clip, is taking fertilizer, urea, MAP, MOP, uh, myriad of potash, uh, UN32, you know, these, these, what I call the vanilla fertilizers. Nutrien makes those vanilla fertilizers, Mosaic, there's a number of us. And what we've been doing in the, in the industry is we've been adding things to those fertilizers. We've been making what I call fertilizer 2.0 or 3.0, depending how far down the chain you are. So I'll, I'll walk through how we did that with monoammonium phosphate. We found a new ingredient and we were able to, to launch a new granular product to the market. And we started in 2018, uh, COVID kind of got in the way. So we're really just kind of finding our legs now and getting going. So it's, it's been a ton of fun. What I want to show you first though is the best worst slide I've ever seen in my entire professional career. Um, and just squint. And this is no, not a dig on the folks that made the slide. This is a slide showing all the companies that went to a recent Ag Tech Innovation Summit in the Salinas area. And so those, the conference organizers said, let's, let's organize all the companies that are here by what they do. And so if you squint hard enough, you can see there's a kind of an X, an X axis and a Y axis here where they're basing things on what they do in the soil, crop and soil health function, biocontrol, bio-based substances, and then living organisms. And then you've got like an eight-way Venn diagram. I didn't know you could go that high uh, with Venn diagrams, showing the different, in, like other different functions. And what this is, is suggesting is that here's the result you want in a new product or the, or the additionality you want to add to a new product. And here's all the different choices you have, and there's substantial overlap in some of these, these choices. And this is what a supplier has to sift through. You've got to look, go to all these meetings to find the unicorn, who's the right ingredient, who's the wrong ingredient. And this is just a lot of these big companies have people, this is their full-time job. It's just sitting through here, listening to pitches. So that's just some of the, the noise we hear. It's like someone yelling at you all day long. It's like Jim at my committee meetings 15 years ago. Thanks, Jim. Um, but you, you can just see how busy it is. And so one thing we have in our process at Nutrien is can your product go through our production process? So we hand them this, this, this flow chart here, this recipe on how to make phosphorus fertilizer, and we say, can your product handle sulfuric acid exposure? So that's usually kicks a bunch out. Can your product handle filtration? Can your product handle several different heat steps? And so it's, it's trying to align this scaling of what a nutrient would need and what another fertilizer supplier would need with just how we make the product because we're, we're not gonna change this process. This has been done and dusted for a long time, this process. Uh, same with urea, 
Same with UN32 production, mining of, of MOP0060. This is, this is done. Um, so it's, it's hard to find that fit. So we went down this journey several years ago to find the right ingredient provider to let us innovate. And we found a provider out of Alberta and they, they have a micronized sulfur, a very small particle sulfur size that comes out of natural gas production and oil and gas production. And so they could survive this process. Their engineers could say, hey, here's where we fit in with your process, let's go. So we came up with this, with this uh, formula. Here's the full name, and I'll talk about more about the marketing here in a second. Smart Nutrition MAP plus MST. So MAP is your typical 11520, and we add micronized sulfur technology to it. Smart Nutrition is so we can give it a, a brand identity and a marketing identity. It also makes for some good hats. And then here's that final formulation, a granular formula that's a 943016 sulfur. So that's the innovation. We took MAP and we added something to it that could survive the process. And I don't know if you guys remember that website, Will It Blend? Same concept. Most things won't. Uh, they, they fall apart when we start talking about the engineering of a product. And that's, that's always a challenge. So why did we add sulfur to a product? Because that's the innovation. It wasn't in the phosphate itself. We used MAP as the carrier. <laughs> Some, someone's excited to buy MAP plus MST. Um, thank you. I got the order book ready. Um, what, we, what we learned from our data coming back from the field, whether it's soil data, tissue data, grower experience, we have a whole network of farmers that we can call on to get market intel from, is they were struggling with seeing yellowing of their crops, particularly in the Midwest of the United States. Do some further dives into that. That's sulfur deficiency. So what we, we came up with our product idea was like, let's take a phosphate product, add sulfur to it, and now get a two for one uh, agronomic impact. So I'll go through some data here in a second, but that's what we're seeing. Folks are calling, what's wrong with my crop? Moreover, who do I blame? Uh, this guy? He's the one who signed the Clean Air Act a long time ago and cleaned up a lot of the sulfur in the air, the pollution. And we have less, uh, there's, there's an actual picture of him signing it. Um, nice picture. Uh, there's also some media that's been coming out saying here's why clean air is, is bad for your, your bread and connecting it into the crops. What's that yellowing doing to the crop? Well, here's really what happened. In 1990, we put in some pretty strict air scrubbing laws that took a lot of that sulfur out of the air itself. And when you, when you convert some of that sulfur coming down onto the crop, you're talking about, in some areas, these dark red areas, uh, we're here, we, we were okay. Uh, but here, here you have about 40 pounds of free sulfate per acre coming down annually. That's how much sulfur was in the air. That's a lot of free fertilizer, right? So that's 1990. Uh, dust off your vanilla ice tape if you need to remember that, that day. And then just move forward as the air got cleaner and just look at the legend change. Now we're down to, in some of these formerly, you know, 40 pounds, now you're down to like five pounds. It's a lot less sulfur coming down in the air. And it's taken a long time for this signal to kind of show up through the, uh, through the, the crop data, the yield data, trial data. And I think most importantly, your grower sending you a picture at eight in the morning saying, what's wrong with my crop? It's, it's just coming up more and more. So what we've seen here, and this is a, a back of the envelope kind of calculation, is just the change in the sulfur budget on a farm. A lot less free sulfur from the air because we have cleaner air, that's a good thing. We also have had some declines in organic matter, and that's a, a source of sulfur for plants. That's a, a, a substantial decrease. And on the back end, our yields are all up. We're removing more and more sulfur than we ever have before just in the harvested product. So this is an unbalanced budget. This is not how I run my budget at my house. I'd be in bad shape, right? Um, I don't know if it's too low of a blow to throw a U of A under the bus right now, but uh, <laughs> a U of A budget right here, uh, mostly for their sports. Um, so, sorry if I, I hope you're not videotaping. Uh, so we have more deficiencies popping up and you can just see it. Here's my corn example. Yara took this photo. Uh, we have wheat showing up here. This is a wheat deficiency. What's wrong with my crop? Here's soybeans all across that, the, the Midwest, particularly the eastern part in the Great Lakes region. But here's a great picture out of Ontario. This, uh, the, the extension agency there 
they left an untreated strip in their field. They didn't put any sulfur down and look at that yellowing. And they can convert it to a yield here on weed. It's a 16 bushel an acre yield loss for not treating sulfur. So you can see in our heads, we're trying to spin. Like the sulfur is the story. It's not really the phosphate. It's adding that synergy, adding that element of sulfur. So you can uh, look up the recent uh, wheat prices, convert that into a, a, a 16 times whatever it is, and you'll get a, an actual financial penalty that the grower has for not investing in sulfur. We see this over and over again. So that's where we, we added our micronized sulfur technology. And here, this little, looks like a fingerprint or something. That's what we're doing. We took the sulfur and it's elemental sulfur and we made it very, very small. So when the microbes need to oxidize that material, they are ready to go. They have a nice surface area. And this is a, a different kind of technology relative to other sulfur sources in the market. So there's our, there's, our, there's our marketing spin. That's our agronomic pitch. And you get it out into a formula that you're familiar with. Most growers are super familiar with MAP. Here we're just adding that 16S sulfur. So formulation trade-offs. Uh, how many of you folks know where this icon's from? Little plants versus zombies fan. That's a happy plant. That, ha that plant is full of sulfur and, and phosphorus and nitrogen and potassium. He's ready to make little suns for you so you can fight the zombies. Uh, thanks for bearing with an old reference now. Um, but this plant is looking for that form of sulfur, sulfate. That's how it wants to pull it into the plant and make use out of it. And so what we have here with sulfur products is a formulation trade-off. You can put sulfate in your product and solve your sulfur issue that way, but there's trade-offs. It's immediately plant available. They're, they're cheap, they're simple salts. They're, they're, it's also found in organic matter, but that sulfate is prone to leaching, just moving right through the soil profile, just like nitrate. And so if it rains on top of your fertilizer application, you don't have any sulfur. So you can make another decision and get elemental sulfur. And so that's what we did. We picked elemental sulfur because uh, we like these guys. These are microbes. They're all for like diseases and stuff. Nobody makes like a neutral soil microbe yet, little doll, but there's a business idea. Um, these are all like strep, strep and all that. So I don't know, don't tell anyone that. Um, but the elemental sulfur is a unique material because it's not plant available as soon as you put it out, like the sulfur forms. It's transformed by microbes, which are controlled by heat and, humi and soil moisture. And so you can put your elemental sulfur out early when, you know, sometimes in the fall or early spring, you don't have to worry about that sulfur going anywhere, that leaching piece. We've kind of solved for that. And as, as the temperature warms up, your crop growth warms up, and those microbes should be turning over the sulfur, that elemental sulfur, making it plant available. So it's kind of a, a slower release uh, kind of sulfur source. So th that's the decision we made. That was the, the formulation choice, and we're, we're pretty happy with that. We don't want the sulfur just leaching out. So here's some data just showing MAP versus our MAP plus MST. This is uh, 44 site years across all across the Corn Belt and Southern Corn Belt. And so what we see here is when we just use MAP alone, 189 bushels an acre of corn. When we add our MAP plus MST, and this is even the spring and the fall application period, uh, we can add about 15 bushels to that, to that grower's bottom line. And so that's showing where that sulfur piece is fitting in. And we can tack it on to the map they're already familiar with, which makes it a little easier for a grower to take on a new practice and for an ag retailer to bring in a new material to the bin because it's not super different. It's not that big Venn, seven, eight way Venn diagram I showed you earlier. This is fairly familiar. Uh, people can kind of grab onto this. So if you make a product, you have to launch a product and that's fun. You have to identify the needs, and that took us a long time. What's the signal that we need to chase to innovate? We've, we've decided on sulfur. You have to do trials. That makes for significant investment in money and time and personnel. Then you gotta go through marketing and regulatory. And then at the end, you just start printing money, right? No, it's, it's slow. Ag's a slow business. It takes, we've been in this, in this for five years. We're just now kind of hitting that upward ramp. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to be on the ramp side. Those early years are tough though, as you learn how to, to find your product's niche. So when you're, when you're an agronomist at Nutrien, you get to make YouTube videos. I refuse to do TikTok, write that down. Uh, but here's me on YouTube, I'm in front of a giant sandcastle marketing thing of a, of, a, of, a, of a combine. And here I am in 
in uh, Iowa in July talking about the benefits of our product. And we, we blast this out over YouTube and uh, we have an Instagram, I'll do Instagram. Um, but it's, it's been a lot of fun to come up with this product and, and talk about some of the synergy of phosphate and, and sulfur and get the word out. So as you ramp up your marketing, we attach, we like to attach the agronomy to it. And here we are uh, kind of showing this example. You can't see me sitting in like a 90% humidity day in like this tent. Uh, they somehow photoshopped all that out, but it was, it was not a good day to do a, do a, te to do a YouTube video. So one thing we've learned along the way is just how do we help our growers understand the, the sulfur piece? Because not everywhere you go has a sulfur shortage. You know, I, I pointed out some of the areas of the Midwest and up into the Great Lakes and even Ontario. You know, we, we, not every area has a shortage risk. You know, we've done trials in, uh, in, in the Dakotas and they, they don't have the issue. Um, they don't have the problem with sulfur. So helping our customers, which are ag retailers, help their customers, the growers, figure out, okay, you're gonna buy this product, here's where it's going to work best. Finding that, that slot, right? That's, that takes a lot of time. So we've spent significant resources figuring that out, trying to figure out the carryover. If you put it down in year one, do you have sulfur left over in year two? So you don't have to do a back-to-back, -back, just providing some of that application guidance. Time's always important. If you're texting me at like four in the morning, what's wrong with my crop? You know, our product's not gonna help you. You're better off just getting a foliar sulfur product, spraying the crop itself, and dealing with your sulfur shortage because ours takes time. Our ours takes those little friendly microbes that we're dependent on to transform the, the elemental sulfate, sulfur into sulfate. So how much time do you have? It's a crucial question for all of us. <laughs> how patient are you, right? Uh, some crops are more sensitive to sulfur deficiencies than other. Canola, super, super user of sulfur. Uh, you go to like something like lettuce, not as big of a sulfur user, so that matters. Uh, how bad is it? Sometimes you get these reports and these pictures and the, the crops, you know, like a, a yellow color. They're so sulfur shorted, short on sulfur. Some of them, not so bad. And then logistics. Logistics trumps everything in agriculture. If you slow a grower down in the spring or the fall, they're going to be grumpy with you and you're gonna hear about it, um, they'll send you mean TikToks. And so what we have to do here is launch a new product, but we have to test so much on handling, how much dust does it make, what does it blend with, how do you store it, what it how does it store under humid conditions, how does it store under dry conditions, can I leave it in the sun? You have to know all these things before you launch the product. So getting a handle on those logistics, it takes time. So with that, I'd love to take any questions. I, I don't want to hammer you with so much data that you, you, you put in your order for MAP plus MST at the end of this meeting. Um, any, any questions about innovating in sulfur? Anyone want to see that eight-way Venn diagram again? I'd love to show it. And don't forget to take your, uh, do the survey. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for this very comprehensive presentation. A couple of quick questions. <clears throat> uh, one is concerning the safety uh, during production and handling of the product. Uh, the second one is concerning the, the grade. Do you produce only one grade? Uh, and the third one, uh, well, concerning the difference between self, uh, the use of sulfur and the use of sulfate. And before developing your products and mosaic product, were, uh, were the farmers using uh, sulfates uh, and seed of sulfur? Thank you. Yeah, and the handling, that's, that's we spend a, not just formulating, but it's formulating so that a retailer can store the product safely and a grower can use the product safely. So our product has to go through uh, explosion risk tests and, and dust production tests and things like that, inhalation risk. So there's a lot of safety concerns because that handling is it's uh you know once it leaves the plant you got to kind of engineer it so that it's uh it's going to be safe for everybody to use good question uh your second question was on the grain size um yeah we we make one one grain size one screen size right now and the the, the analysis yeah we only we only make one analysis at this point 943 016s I, it, it worked best for our, our production facility and uh, what our customers were looking for. They still wanted a high phosphorus load on the, on the, the analysis in, in addition to the sulfur. 
And then your last question was? Yeah, uh, so our main goal was to produce uh, a product that had the slower release sulfur source. So that's why we intentionally made the, the change to pick up the, the elemental sulfur. And that's 91% of that 16%, 91% of the of that blend is elemental sulfur. There's a little bit of, of uh, sulfate in there, but not a whole lot. Um, and there's, there's other products on the market, 100% elemental sulfur all the way to 100% sulfate. And so we wanted to, to make a choice with our with our innovator with the MST to pick up that uh, that slower release that was our intention on the product design thank you okay. thank you